The year is 1909, and the Consolidation Coal Company, or Consol, has a problem. Two years earlier, they had expanded their operations into Kentucky after negotiating a rather unusual deal with a school teacher turned coal miner and philanthropist named John C. C. Mayo. With the deal, they had purchased the existing coal camps on Miller's Creek, just south of Paintsville, and the rights to further mine the area in Johnson County near present-day Van Leer. With that purchase, they had also reserved the option to purchase a further 100,000 acres of land located in southern Pike County, which extended into and around the headwaters of two rivers in Letcher County, the Elkhorn Creek of the Big Sandy River, and several headwater branches of the North Fork of the Kentucky River. It was this option which made the deal unusual and unique. Mayo had presented Consol with two independent but cooperating surveys of the land, Richard Bro's original survey and a survey that had been done by Mayo's Northern Coal and Coke Company. If, after conducting their own survey, Consol could verify the reports presented by Mayo, they would purchase the land from the Northern Coal and Coke Company and fulfill Mayo's unusual deal. Consol had agreed to build coal camps throughout both parts of the purchase, the likes of which had never been built by any industry on two continents. They had also agreed to an unheard of management deal, the bulk of which centered around the miners' pay and living standards but also included free and open trade with the local populations and existing towns. This deal would later become a blueprint for the vast changes that swept the industrial world in the decades leading up to World War II. Consol sent three separate survey teams to the area, and in the spring of 1909, the reports came in and just as Richard Rose had assured John Mayo when he had purchased the land, Consol now had five separate and independent geological surveys which confirmed that the land around the present-day town of Jenkins was the richest and most significant coal find in the United States. However, the bulk of this coal find was not to be found on the Big Sandy River, but across the mountain on what was then known as Wright's Fork on the Kentucky River. After receiving the survey information, Consolidation decided to purchase the land around Elkhorn Creek. The problem was that the area was completely cut off from the rest of the industrial world. The only significant road in the area was the Mount Sterling Pound Gap Road and although this road followed the Big Sandy River and passed through Elkhorn Creek, it was little more than a muddy, dusty wagon trail through the mountain. Consol then turned to the Lexington and Eastern or l &E Railroad to remedy the situation. The l &E Railroad immediately sent survey teams to scout out the course for the new branch line. That summer, while the two companies were negotiating the cost of extending the line from Wolf County near Jackson, Kentucky, over a hundred miles to Wright's Fork or present-day Mac Roberts, Consol and the railroad received bad news. Although the survey teams had noted an apparent ease in extending the route along the wide floodplains of the Kentucky River, they also reported that several bridges and tunnels would have to be built and that the project would take nearly four years to complete. Seeking another option, Consol turned its attention to the Baltimore and Ohio or the B&O Railroad. Ten years earlier, the B&O began building a spur which would run 40 miles along the Big Sandy River from Paintsville to Shelbyana, Kentucky. In order to increase its earnings from coal, passengers, and timber in Kentucky. But due to a lack of capital interest and in investment, the project had stalled 
with a little over eight miles being completed. Consol will become the primary investor in that project and pay to extend the spur an additional 20 miles from Shelbyana to Elkhorn Creek. This new rail line would be owned and operated by the Consolidation Coal Company and named the Sandy Valley and Elkhorn or the SB&E Railroad. However, because of the ruggedness and geography of the terrain, the survey teams reported that it would take almost as long to complete the 52 miles of the SV&E Railroad as the expansion of the l &E Railroad to Wright's Fork. This meant that Consol had taken an option to purchase not only the greatest coal field in the country, but a coal field that, because of its remoteness and lack of workforce, could potentially take seven to ten years to develop and produce its first lump of coal. The rest of the story is how Jenkins, Kentucky got its name and how the town became the regional headquarters for the Consolidation Coal Company and later Beth Elkhorn's operations in eastern Kentucky. In the early 1900s, West Virginia coal baron and future senator Clarence Whalen Watson helped the Consolidation Coal and Mining Company of Cumberland, Maryland reorganize and combine with several other mining operations from Pennsylvania and West Virginia. For his help in making the merger successful, Mr. Watson was rewarded by being named as the president for the newly expanded Consolidation Coal Company. And now, thanks to the deal he had made with Mayo, and the reports from the railroads. Senator Watson's stint as president for the Consolidation Coal Company looked to be coming to an end. Fortunately for him and Consol, the stockholders and the board of directors for the company read like a who's who of the financial, industrial, military, and political world. The particulars of Consolidation's board meeting in the fall of 1909 are unknown, but shortly after that meeting, the SV&E and the L&E Railroad started construction, and Consolidation reached out to a third railroad in another state. Eight miles across Pine Mountain, near a town called Pound, Virginia, there was a little used spur of the Interstate Railroad, or the IR&R, through a connection at Glamorgan, Virginia. The Interstate was a short haul operation, providing transportation of coal and iron from several of the mining operations in Wise County, Virginia, to the l &N Railroad at Appalachia. A year earlier, Interstate's parent company, the Virginia Coal and Iron Company had acquired financial backing to extend their line and make a connection with the Norfolk and Western Railroad in Norton, Virginia. The man who had approved the financial backing for Interstate was George Carroll Jenkins, a Baltimore banker and one of the directors of the Consolidation Coal Company. Mr. Jenkins and his wife Catherine Key Jenkins were from two of Baltimore's most prominent families. For nearly a century, the Jenkins family ran Jacoby and Jenkins, Baltimore's most prestigious maker of sterling silver. His wife was a great niece of Francis Scott Key and heavily involved in Baltimore society. As a young man, Jenkins served in the 52nd Regiment of the Maryland National Guard. And in 1862, he left his father's business to serve as a private in the Confederate Army, 1st Maryland Cavalry, Company C. And at the time of his death, Mr. Jenkins would be one of the oldest Confederate veterans in Maryland. After his father's death in 1882, George Jenkins became the director of the Savings Bank of Baltimore and the Merchants Mechanics National Bank. Later, Mr. Jenkins would become a director of the Atlantic Coast Line, 
the Louisville and National Railroad, and the Safe Deposit and Trust Company. He was also a director of United Railways, the Baltimore and Ohio Southwestern Railroad, the Canton Company, the Maryland Life Insurance Company, and of course, the Consolidation Coal Company. By the fall of 1910, a solution to Consol's dilemma was found. They would pay to have the interstate spur extended four miles to a spot near present-day Elmira, Virginia. It is to here that Consol would have the work crews, supplies, equipment, and construction materials shipped, unloaded, then transported across the mountain using wagons and sleds to the first construction site, a town they would name Jenkins in honor of George Carroll Jenkins. By this time, the Consolidation Coal Company and John Mayo had finally agreed on a deal for the lands. Although the actual purchase price is unknown, the deal Mayo made with Consol was extraordinary for the time. Typically, coal camps consisted of a company store and shanties used as housing for the miners. However, thanks to the deal with Mayo, Consol was to build, quote, modern cities with all the amenities of the 20th century, unquote, for the miners and their families. In addition, the stores, services, and medical facilities of these cities would be open for trade with the local population. Consol would also pay the miners 35 cents per hour in addition to the customary company script to encourage trade with the local towns and bring prosperity to the people of the mountains. Mayo and his associates would become major stockholders in the Consolidation Coal Company. A total of 12 deeds were made out for the land. Six were signed in November of 1910 after the planning and construction crews began arriving on the Elkhorn Creek. The other six were signed in February of 1911 after the construction of the city of Jenkins had begun. Jenkins would officially be established as a six-class town and incorporated in 1912. Consol maintains in their book History of the Consolidation Coal Company, 1864 to 1934, that they had always strived to improve the working and living conditions of their employees. However, they do admit that after entering the coal fields of Kentucky, that that effort was tripled. The ultimate expression of this occurred in the towns in Letcher County, especially Jenkins. In all, the Consolidation Coal Company would spend over $40 million, or a little over $1 billion in today's money, on the development in Latra County. If you enjoyed today's story, please hit the like and subscribe button, and don't forget to share this video with all your friends. Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for your patronage, and for watching this story today. You have a blessed day.